Uh, Diolch lawr iawn um, am y gwahoddiad yn cyfr... Oh, sorry, it's the wrong country, isn't it? <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Uh, fear not, I, I'm, I'm from Wales, uh, but I speak your language. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A hundred years ago, this week, my forebears in the 38th Welsh Division took part in the Battle of Mamet's Wood on the Somme. They were brave men facing impossible odds. More than 4,000 men died in that single battle. That's the same number that took their own lives in the UK and Ireland in 2014. We don't know how many of those men were dads who killed themselves because they could, so, they could no longer see their children. As Mike has just mentioned, I run a small charity in Wales, FNF Both Parents Matter Cymru. We used to be simply Families Need Fathers Cymru, but that caused us a problem. Welsh politicians would say to me, Families Need Fathers? That's a bit gender exclusive, isn't it? Have you thought about changing your name? I'm a pragmatist. If changing our name would make it easier for us to achieve our goals, then we should at least think about it. We also see a large number of women, grandmothers, new partners, and many mums who are not the main carers for their children. In fact, just over 30% of those who approach us for help are women. While we were struggling with the decision about the name of the charity, I went to see one member of the Welsh Assembly with a dad we were helping. He spoke about the problems he was encountering with Kafkas Cymru and then introduced me. I got as far as my name and the name of our charity before I was stopped. Families need fathers, fathers for justice. You're all the same. You need to understand that five or six women a year are killed by their partners or ex-partners in Wales and that more than outweighs a handful of dads who don't get to see their kids meeting over. Now that assembly member was chair of the children's committee at the time. Uh, one of the reasons why Mike said he wanted me to talk at the conference was because I run a frontline agency. And sometimes it really does feel like we're on the front line in the war against dads. At our support meetings, we try to give people a better understanding of the situation they find themselves in. Having a safe space where parents and grandparents can talk about their experiences and feelings is really valuable. When they contact us through our helpline or come to our meetings, they're often really traumatized. They tell us about ways that parenting support, children's services, the police, or family courts have treated them unfairly. It's as though they're suffering from shell shock. The horrors of life on the front line in the war on dads has taken its toll on their mental health and resilience. These brave dads often talk about injustice how social workers lie, write deeply flawed reports, and support the primary carer in everything they do and say. How the police respond differently to male and female callers reporting domestic violence. How the courts are biased against men. I dealt with a case recently where mum alleged domestic violence against dad she told him that she didn't love him anymore and wanted him to move out. He committed the ultimate atrocity. He refused. He was also told to get out by his children's social worker. She said he needed to think about what was best for the children. Social services were involved because one of his kids had been involved in a near fatal road traffic accident while walking home from school with the mum. 
After the accident, Dad got a new job working as a cleaner in the university from 5 in the morning till 8.30 every day. So he could spend all of his time at the hospital with his son helping him on the slow road to recovery. After 10 months in hospital, his son came home. We told Dad, sit tight, don't leave the house. Eventually, Mum made the first move and went to live with her aunt, taking the three children and saying that Dad would never see them again. We got the case into court. Dad's months of dedication at his disabled son's bedside didn't matter at all. Social services confirmed that Mum was a victim of verbal domestic abuse. The court ordered that Dad's contact with his three children would be, and I'm quoting here, as agreed between the parents. <laughs> I love orders like that. If they could agree on contact, why were they in the court in the first place? The district judge then took it upon himself to make an occupation order, despite the fact that Mum hadn't applied for that, and gave Dad two days to get out or he'd be arrested. Dad now lives in a YMCA hostel and sees the children only when it suits Mum. So, is it fair? <coughs> One of the key aspects of our work in Wales is research. And I've been really impressed with the extent to which I've heard in the presentations earlier today some hard facts. We've run an annual Welsh Dad survey for the past two years, which we publish in the week leading up to Father's Day. The survey asks questions about Dad's experience of engaging with public services in Wales. Only 16% of those who completed the 2016 survey identified as non-resident fathers. 9% were the primary or sole carers for their children. A consistent theme emerged in the survey, even from those who reported positive experiences. Now this, this was a contribution from a dad who ticked the strongly positive box for experience of health services. We did another research project looking at the extent to which services successfully engaged with fathers. Unbelievably, it says here, Welsh government confirmed that they did not have any data about the success of parenting support services at engaging with dads. Even more surprisingly, they said that they did not require those services that they fund to record the gender of parents they support or engage with. Our survey showed that from 32 responses from different services, service providers this is, covering 169,000 service users, the average level of engagement with fathers was between 3 and 11%. In early years, the figure was even lower than that, with one service recording 181 mothers and only one father in the 12-month period on which they reported. So, armed with my research, I went to see the officials. I made one recommendation, that services funded by Welsh Government should record the gender of parents accessing their help. The head of family support looked me in the eye and said, no, that would be too difficult. <laughs> so I challenged that. Her boss wrote to me to confirm the position. 
I raised it through the Welsh Assembly. One of our trustees was the Shadow Minister for Communities and Housing. I had another Assembly member ask the Minister in committee about the lack of engagement with dads. Nothing changed. I wrote to the First Minister. Carwin Jones, father of two, lives in Bridgend with his lovely wife Lisa. I asked him to require services funded by Welsh Government to record the gender of parents they support. He wrote back. So it seems that we can't work out whether a parent is male, female, or indeed transgender. Now in Wales, we also have some new legislation. To inform the legislative process, the Welsh Government convened a task and finish group that included a number of experts, such as Barbara Natasagara, who invented the MARAC process, as well as Paula Hardy, the Chief Executive of Welsh Women's Aid. The lead author was a Dr Amanda Robinson of Cardiff University, who wrote this. Of course, the Welsh Government didn't necessarily accept all of the um, things that were included in the task and finish report. Now we also know about our friends in the CPS. <laughs> oh, please. I'm sure she's kind to animals. <laughs> now they, they have... Oh, no. Stop, it'll only encourage me, please. They have a violence against women and girls strategy. Did you know that only 70% of victims are actually female? So in 2013-14, there were 13,500 men and boys who are officially victims of violence against women and girls in the UK. And a further 16,000 people prosecuted in a criminal court where the CPS don't know the gender of the victim. So, who believes that there really is a state-sponsored war on dads? <laughs> but fear not. Gentlemen and ladies, we're doing it wrong. In the state's war on dads, we're not doing very well. We need a new direction, a new purpose, and a new strategy based on the following concepts. <laughs> now, there's a clue in the role description, really. If they're the enemy, they're going to shoot at you. We all expend huge amounts of angst, bile, and man hours, and let's not forget women hours, railing against the injustice of the system. All of our Facebook pages, Twitter feeds, and blog posts are dominated by invective. You won't believe what Women's Aid have done now. And can you credit that feminist academics have once again conclusively proven that men are violent misogynists who need to be castrated at best and then ritually disemboweled once they've made a will and handed over all their spare cash. <laughs> I went to an Equalities and Human Rights Commission seminar informing their landmark report, Is Britain Fairer 2015? They were proposing to include a section that said something like, there is growing evidence that women are finding it difficult to provide the necessary evidence to access legal aid for family disputes. I said I was sure that women did find it difficult, 
but that men found it more difficult. The Equalities and Human Rights Commission said to me, prove it. So we did. 226 men in England and Wales contributed to a survey I created using the same set of questions used by rights of women. It showed that 70% of men were unable to provide the necessary evidence, while the most recent rights of women survey showed that 37% of women faced the same difficulty. Stop having a go at others who are broadly on our side. I was blocked a few weeks ago by the official Father for Justice Twitter feed. I think the comment was something along the lines of, so here's another chancer who's touting for business and funding. <laughs> and that brings me nicely on to... Now I know that that might be uh, a little bit controversial. But honestly, we've just accepted that we're in a war with the state. Why would we think we have a chance if we're turning down modern weapons in favour of pointy sticks? Now I want to show you a picture of my hero. An inspirational figure who has succeeded after many years of hard work, someone who epitomizes the concept, together, stronger. I was rather hoping that it would be a slightly better, you know, <laughs> but hey. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's, that's, no, not him. <laughs> now, BAUZO stands for the Black Association of Women Stepping Out. They are a member organization of Welsh Women's Aid. Now, it might surprise you to learn that Wales has a massive ethnic minority population. According to the 2011 census, 23% of those people living in Wales were born in another country. Yeah, England. <laughs> in terms of the black and minority ethnic population, however, the figure is around about 4%, almost exclusively concentrated in Cardiff, Swansea, Newport and Wrexham. Bauzo has been operating since 1995. In 2015, they supported 5,292 service users, an increase from 3,370 just two years before. Their accounts show that in 2014, their annual income was... You can bring about a huge amount of change for a small group of people when you have three million pounds a year coming in. So, anybody got any thoughts about that? Thank you. <laughs>